Welcome to La La Landorus, a false swipe gaming film. Landorus bursts onto the scene in Generation 5 as part of Black and White's Forces of Nature Genie Trio, a fascinating set of legendary Pokemon which it is the leader of, able to calm Thunderous and Tornadus when their storms are raging, leaving bountiful harvests in its wake. For this, it has thus earned two names. One is Guardian of the Fields, and the other is Great Landorus, which is incredibly fitting because today we're going over its performance in the competitive scene. The time has finally come to answer this long-awaited question for one of the most notorious Pokemon of all time. And so we ask, how great was Landorus actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. When Black and White were first released, there was no Landorus Incarnate and Landorus Therian. Initially, the only one of the two in existence was what would later become known as the Incarnate form. However, back then, it was just Landorus. And if you really want to get technical, in the first six months of the generation, it was called by its Japanese name, Randorosu, since Pokemon games didn't get simultaneous worldwide releases until XY. Furthermore, Landorus Incarnate is generally known as one of the most dangerous special attackers of all time. But in those early days of Gen 5, it had not yet received its hidden ability sheer force, which was what boosted it to such a status. Instead, Landorus made its initial mark with physical moves using another ability, Sand Force, establishing itself as a staple on Sand Teams for how it capitalized on the weather for monstrously powerful boosted stab earthquakes, as well as the perfect coverage move, Boosted Stone Edges, which slammed through would-be earthquake answers like Rotom Wash. You couldn't just replace the weather on Lando either. Have fun switching your Politoed into such a powerful earthquake, let alone Ninetales. Obama Snow was rare, Stealth Rock weak, and got hit hard by Earthquake anyway. Lando's superb offensive move pull in conjunction with its high attack stat and outstanding 101 speed that gave it an incredibly crucial boost over the tier's litany of base 100 allowed it to run a variety of excellent sets. It was immediately one of the tier's best scarfers. Its speed crucially gave it the jump on boosted Quiver Dance Volcarona. It had an unusually powerful cleanup move for a scarfer since its Earthquake was boosted by Sand and it maintained momentum since its aforementioned superb move pull had one of the best moves in the game, U-Turn. Non-Scarf Lander sets were also among the metagame's biggest threats, as with Hidden Power Ice off of its solid special attack stat, even uninvested, Landorus could even effortlessly rip past Gliscor and Tangrowth, which would otherwise tank its trio of Earthquake, Stone Edge, and U-Turn quite easily. There were two ways Lando could go about it. Either it ditched U-Turn and set up substitutes to fully capitalize on the many switches it caused, ensuring it safely slammed the incoming target with the strongest move possible, or it could run the same moves as its Scarf set, except exchanging the Scarf for an Expert Belt, which allowed it to bluff Scarf and grab free kills against unsuspecting opponents thinking it was locked into a certain move. The only Pokemon safe against Lando's Earthquake, Stone Edge, Hidden Power, Ice combination were Skarmory and Bronzong until Landorus Sub and Expert Belt set started swapping out Stone Edge for Smackdown, which made them, as well as Rotom Wash, vulnerable to Earthquake. Thus, pretty much nothing switched into Lando safely. What made Lando particularly terrifying was how it shared pretty much all its checks with Sand Rush Excadrill. Thus, when Lando destroyed one of his checks as it did so effortlessly, it wasn't just making itself more dangerous. It was clearing the path for the best late game Pokemon in the tier. Of course, Lando was outstanding even without extra drill, and once the latter was banned, it became even more of a threat, especially since it paired so well with another one of OU's scariest, Terrakion. One could attempt to withstand assaults from Sub or E-Belt Lando with the Hippowdon that became popular in the post extra drill metagame, though it required caution, but Lando could also slot in Swords Dance if it desired, letting it shred it as well as other checks like Fortress and Slowbro with utter ease. Landorus was pretty much a perfect offensive Pokemon and was a hugely defining force of Black and White 1 OU. Some players thought it was already ban worthy for how difficult, borderline impossible it was to handle defensively, while at the same time possessing such an offensive shredding speed stat. But that was nothing compared with what was about to come. With the release of Black and White 2, Landorus was no longer just Landorus. It was Landorus Incarnate as opposed to the newly added Landorus Therian. Landorus Incarnate or Lando I also gained its hidden ability Sheer Force and went from a primarily physical attacker to a primarily special one, with sheer force boosting moves with secondary effects as well as essentially making life orb riskless since it removed the item's recoil on boosted moves by the ability. And with the two combined, Lando Eye became even more threatening, dishing out utterly obscene damage. It wasn't just earth power shattering nearly everything without even taking recoil damage, making it infinitely more spammable than sand force life orb. It was focus blast with the same effect, absolutely destroying Skarmory and Rotom Wash and doing so immediately with no 
still need to hit them with Smackdown first. Focus Blast was so absurdly powerful that it achieved the astonishing feat of one hit KOing Ferrothorn of all things. Hidden Power Ice wasn't boosted by Sheer Force, but it was still so well worth the move slot to so effortlessly destroy Gliscor, Dragonite, and of course, the newly added Lander Styrian. Of course, Black and White 2 had also gotten much faster with the addition of new threats like Keldeo, Tornado Styrian, and Scarf Genesect, but Lando I would set up a rock polish and that would be that. It was one of the tier's best wall breakers and sweepers, and with just one set, the only OU viable Pokemon that could withstand this brutal assault were the Laddie Twins, and especially defensive Celebi. And this was of course incredibly abusable with pursuit support from Landorus Incarnate's best friend, Tyranitar, whose choice band set also smashed anyone foolish enough to bring Chansey to such an overwhelmingly offensive metagame. Cries to ban Lando I arose quickly, as the player base became acquainted with how effortlessly it crushed everything in the path, and the issues of its only decent checks being the highly abusable Laddie Twin and Celebi was exacerbated by the fact that these were also tasked with answering another threat with barely any checks, Keldeo. The pairing of Lando I and Keldeo alongside Titar's pursuit became the metagame's defining offensive core, easily ripping through just about everything, and it was made a million times worse when Lando I, deciding it didn't need to sweep with Rock Polish, slotted U-Turn back into its move slot, allowing it to bypass Celebi itself and making taking the Laddie Twins out even easier. As the player base begged for its ban, Lando I also established itself as an excellent offensive stealth rocker. It was already so naturally threatening just with these three moves that it could easily afford to support its team as well, finding opportunities to do so easily in the game with the many switches it forced. With just Earth Power, Focus Splash, HP Ice, and the standard level of support, meaning the Pursuit T-Tar that was going to be on its team anyway, Lando I pretty much invalidated defensive teams entirely. You couldn't run stall when it was around unless you wanted to get irrevocably thrashed. This was an incredibly unhealthy factor to have in a metagame, and thus Landorus Incarnate was eventually banned from OU. But it wasn't done yet, as Landorus Incarnate even had a solid niche on sand teams and ubers. Since it could be paired with Sand Rush Extra Drill once again, it ran Sand Force to pile on the hurt with Earthquake. It was a fantastic cleaner because Earthquake hit common Arceus forms for major damage, and unlike Extra Drill, Lando immediately had the boost, not needing to find a turn of Swords Dance. Landorus was also fast and dangerous even if Sand wasn't up, an advantage which extended to its best trait, outrunning the most popular Scarfer and best Pokemon in the tier, Genesect. This was absolutely incredible to have late game. And so Landorus Incarnate was pretty much a perfect Pokemon in Generation 5. Yeah, so about that theory and form that came around in Black and White 2. Well, it wasn't broken, but its defensive presence did instantly reshape the metagame. Having such a reliable Intimidate user was an enormous relief in fending off the myriad physical threats in the metagame. Dragonite, Garchomp, Technician Breloom, and especially Terrakion. In Black and White 1, Terrakion had been considered broken, but in Black and White 2, the very appearance of Lando T put that to rest. Not only did it weaken Terrakion no matter what it did, it also took Stone Edge is much better than Gliscor because of Intimidate. In general, even if Lando T didn't counter something, though it very often did, simply slowing it down with Intimidate was incredible. Such defensive stability was rare to come by in a metagame as chaotic as Gen 5 OU, and thus it became quite easy to slap Lando T onto your team, if you weren't abusing its incarnate form instead, of course. It helped that, unlike a defensive Pokemon, Lander Steering was the furthest thing from weak or passive you could get. Not only did it maintain momentum with U-Turn effortlessly, it also hit hard even with without any offensive investment, thanks to a base attack set which rivaled Groudon. Though Lando T's utility set was its easiest to use, the player base did not overlook its own potential to be a threat even while Lando I was around. With how excellent Earthquake and Stone Edge's neutral coverage was, Lando T often ran a dangerous dual dance set early on, flexible in whichever matchup it found itself in. Either Swords Dancing to rip through bulkier teams, or Rock Polishing to finish off faster teams much like its incarnate form. The best part was, even when used as an offensive Pokemon, Lander Styrian's natural defensive profile between its typing and intimidate helped bolster its team's core against major threats like Dragonite, Garchomp, and Terrakion regardless of investment. And this was incredibly valuable for offensive teams which couldn't afford to run truly bulky Pokemon. Dual Dance was the most common set until some time after Lando I's ban, at which point players began to experiment with Lando T's more offensive options. Players began taking a leaf out of the sets Landorus Incarnate had run in its Sand Force days and found that Landorus Styrian utilized them excellently as well. The Scarf variant took off and became Lando T's 
Sea's most common set full stop, playing similarly with its blend of U-turn spam and late game earthquake cleanup. Unlike Scarf Lando I, Scarf Lando T didn't have the speed to check Volcarona, but it did switch in much more easily thanks to Intimidate, letting it answer the likes of Dragonite, Garchomp, and Terrakion more reliably. Additionally, players began experimenting with Smackdown variants. Substitute was easy to use, but Stealth Rock was also popular in the fourth move slot, allowing Lando T to support its team and be a threat simultaneously without really giving up much of anything. Leftovers was always reliable, but Earthplate was popular on the Stealth Rock variant as well, letting it put a serious charge into the likes of Reuniclus. A set with Swords Dance, Superpower, and Fighting Gem became popular as well, letting it shred Skarmory and Rotom Wash without as much repeated prediction as was required with the Smackdown set. Incidentally, even the SD set ran Hidden Power Ice, but why when a plus two Stone Edge would shatter Gliscor? Simple, because it was far more important to deal with other Lander Hysterion as instantly as possible. A great deal of reason Lander Hysterion was running Hidden Power Ice has been opposing Lander Hysterion. Lando T could mix and match and pretty much do whatever it wanted, and this included the utility set too, which also evolved over time. As great a stealth rocker as Lando T was, some players enjoyed putting Sleep Talk on it to more reliably answer Breloom, especially since there were plenty of other good rockers in the tier. Rocky Helmet also began seeing use, allowing Lando T to play offense while on defense. This went hand in hand with its pivot heavy playstyle, ensuring that even if it took a hard hitting outrage, it dished out some crucial chip in return. Lando T could really do whatever it wanted. For example, its fourth move slot in its scarf set was so flexible that it sometimes ran rocks, or could even slot in something like punishment to help against Calm Mind Reuniclus. But whatever it did, Lander Hysteria was a defining piece of Generation 5 OU. And of course, it continues into Ubers, where Lando T was the better of the two forms, as in addition to the solid threat level it posed, it also helped check several of Uber's most dangerous Pokemon. It was superb against non-Lava Plume Groudon, did incredibly well against most Zekrom, and even helped slow down the mighty Extreme Killer Arceus. Talk about an incredible lineup of threats to check. It did so while making the most of its excellent base 91 speed, which put it just above the base 90s that define Ubers. And this was a big deal, because with Earthplate, Lando T smashed through Dialga thinking it was safe, while also putting a major check into Kyogre and Ferrothorn. Another common base 90, Ho-Oh, didn't dare come near Lando T for fear of Stone Edge, as just like its incarnate form, Lando T was pretty much perfect in its own way. It came in halfway through the generation and was one of its most impactful regardless. Alright, alright, alright. Let me take over here. Hey there. I'm Zane, False Wipe Writer. Uh, you haven't heard from me in a little bit. I used to write all the videos here, and these days I just write the VGC stuff. Now, you may wonder why you're hearing from me. Well, that's because this one, this one is personal. Listen, I've been writing for this channel for six years at this point, and I don't think there is a single Pokemon whose name I've had to type out more than this thing here. In fact, here's a little bit of first-hand evidence. My false swipe folder in Google Docs has over a hundred documents. This is all of my notes, ramblings, research, and the scripts for almost everything I have ever written for this channel, give or take a little bit of file mismanagement. I opened every single doc I have ever written and merged them into one huge giga document. Then I searched for Landorus or Lando or Landy or whatever. I ended up with 313 instances of this thing's name showing up. For comparison, I searched Pika, and even with two entire videos dedicated to Pikachu's viability in two separate franchises, that only clocked in at 306 appearances. Oh, and that's without this script. This is by far the most research I have ever compiled on one Pokemon in the channel's history. You thought our new Charizard video was long? Yeah, that only had 120 links in the research. I took notes on 331 different links for this single video. My notes alone are a separate doc that is 76 pages for just VGC. For years, I have dreaded this day, but it is finally here. So I hope you have a glass of water ready, Cullen, because this one's going to do a number on your voice. The reckoning is here. Uh, are you sure we should do this? Maybe we can put Lando off for another- Really? After I wrote all that, we're just going to- Nope, not right now. Maybe another- No, you are dealing with this. There is no turning back. Oh man, I'm scared. Well, it's actually not that good at the beginning, but after that, oh, you better buckle up. Uh, but yeah, in uh, in 2011, Landris wasn't really... You know what, I'll just let you take it from here, Callan. 
That would be because for the first two years of its existence, Landorus was actually playing not just second, but third fiddle to its two underlings. Keep in mind that this is before the advent of Black and White 2 and the Therian forms. And while Landorus has got a sweet 20 base stat difference over them, it was missing out in two important areas, speed and ability. With second and third ability still just a far off dream, Landorus was locked into Sand Force in a meta with no sand setters to be found. The Unova Dex is conspicuous lacking a sand stream mod, leaving Landorus essentially sans ability for all of the 2011 format. Meanwhile, Thunderous and Tornadus get to gallivant around with one of the absolute best abilities in the game, Prankster, spamming Thunder Waves and Swaggers and Tailwinds to their heart's content. These genies were stat-wise the best Pokemon in the game, which is precisely the reason why every single top 8 team at Worlds included at least one of them, and five teams went double genie. Lando's abilities didn't match up, both the other genies were immune to its stab, and it sported a delicious four times ice weakness that rendered it prone to a hidden power ice to the face, courtesy of Thunderous's 10 speed difference. So instead, Landorus waited on the sidelines, watching its other genies warp the meta entirely, and dreamed of a day when it could have a similar impact. 2012 would not quite be that year. The return of Titar did give Landorus some purchase to at least use its ability, but with the benefits of one pseudo legendary came the detriments of another, Garchomp, with better bulk, higher attack and the golden one point more of base speed as well as another sand benefiting ability and the same four times ice weakness it was easy to see Garchomp as just better Landorus when it came to firing off earthquakes what that meant is that those who did make Landorus work took advantage of something else that made it special uh, literally Landorus could function fairly well on the special side as well dodging intimidates and making use of other coverage and while it didn't boast the same power as Garchomp special Landorus was still more than capable of dishing out damage. One of the first players to innovate this type of set was beloved community member and competitor Angel Makoto Masaka Miranda. Even if Landorus doesn't have lower appendages, as far as we can tell, the set proved it had legs, as evidenced by Dewey Ha's fourth place at the San Jose Regionals, Luke Swenson's top eight at the U.S. Nationals, and Stefan Marla's first place in German Nationals. These players used moves like Grass Knot and Hidden Power to achieve coverage no physical Landorus or Guard Shop could dream of. These Landos often opted for Expert Belt for additional firepower or Yachtsberry to patch up the glaring weak spot. Keep in mind that Sheer Force wasn't out yet, so the unmitigated power of Life Orb wasn't available. But Landorus still often played like a worse version of Garchomp or Thunderous, and as the season rolled on towards Worlds, players opted to use those Pokemon instead. Even with its partner in crime Tyranitar appearing in five of the world's top eight teams, Landorus didn't have a single showing, and so it spent yet another year languishing in the dark. In the lore, it's supposed to be the leader of this trio. So why is Thunderous getting all the spotlight? Friendship ended with Thunderous. Now Titar is my best friend. Envy festered and bloomed, consuming Landorus until an extraordinary transformation took place and a monster was born. Now this this is the face you know, and this is not the face of mercy. In fact, Landorus's face is so scary you might call it intimidating. Armed with a boost to its already amazing attack and an absolutely busted ability, Landorus used 2013 to assume its rightful place as king of not only the genies, but all of VGC. It now could both out damage and out utility Garchomp, finally giving it the niche it had desired. The only drawbacks of turning into whatever animal Landorus is supposed to be are a dent in the special attack and speed departments, but players quickly figured out that Landorus Sturian's middling speed could be patched up with a choice scarf. Early users of Landorus Sturian often focus on its attacking prowess, an understandable angle, giving the whopping 145 base attack. If you were getting off Earthquakes next to a ground immune Pokemon, chances are things were going well. Earthquake was mandatory, as was U-turn to Cycle Intimidate and a Rock-type move to hit opposing Genies and Zapdos. Which Rock move was dealer's choice? Rock Slide gave access to incredible Dream breaking potential with scarf flinches and better accuracy, but left Landorus prone to being intimidated itself or walled via wide guard. As an example of just how big the decision could be, Stone Edge could guarantee a one-hit KO against common opposing Thunderous Incarnate spreads, while Rock Slide would always miss out. The final moves were an interesting choice. Superpower was good, sure, but not especially relevant in the meta. And using Fly with a scarf set is like trying to cut your hair with a butter knife. Everyone knows how it's going to end, and it's a huge waste of 
time. Explosion was one other fairly common choice, though sometimes prone to disaster if used into protect. As the format evolved, players started to iterate on sets. Careful choice bands started to make an appearance, a set that took advantage of Landorus's bulk and Intimidate to get off even more powerful attacks. Some players adapted to Focus Sash, which had the benefit of protecting Landorus against opposing Scar sets and allowed it to run Protect in the final slot. In a team composition, Landorus made for a very strong check to physical fighting types Excadrill and Metagross, as well as a potent offensive threat of its own. From the beginning, Landorus Therian put up good showings at nationals around the world, earning itself a plethora of top 8 finishes. Aaron Zhang was one early convert, replacing his own Garchomp with Landorus and leaving with no regrets. For now, I'll still shout out these players, the early adopters, those who saw the shape of things to come. At the US Nationals, Harrison Saylor secured a 6th place finish by pairing Lando with the lesser seen Tornadus. In Australia, Peter Seale used Latios as his earthquake immunity for a top 4 finish, and over in Europe, Miguel T, Luigi Lo Guidice, and Lorenzo Galassi all achieved top 8s at the Italy and Germany Nationals, with a mix of Pokemon such as Cresselia, High Dragon, and Rotom W. Special mention to Jamal L. Motaikil for his silver medal at the German Nationals, and Michael Reichert for placing top 8 at both Nationals. By the time Worlds rolled around, Landorus had established itself as the premier intimidator in the format, and one of the biggest physical threats, especially when paired with an Earthquake immune Pokemon like Cresselia, Rotom Wash, or perhaps most notably, Thunderous. Allow me to introduce you to the genies of healthy meta. You're gonna get used to seeing them. That's right, Lando and Thundee were cool again, and uh, Tyranitar is the third bro now. Sorry, Tornadus. Thunderous covered the water types that Landorus struggled with very well, while Landorus's Intimidate helped Thunderous survive as well. Both packed utility and power in a nice little package. As mentioned before, Landorus was capable of performing with any ground immune partner, especially with the number one usage mon, Cresselia. But keep Thunderous in mind, these two are in it for the long haul. When it came to worlds, Landorus Therian was one of the most used Pokemon in the top 8, notching 2nd, 3rd, and 7th place finishes thanks to Ryosuke Kosuge, Aaron Zhang, and Luigi Lo Giudice. Aaron and Ryosuke used the same Landorises, Landori, all year long, and in fitting with the rest of their teams, the sets were nearly identical, adamant, as fast and as powerful as possible, with a Focus Sash, 3 attacks, and Protect. The only difference was that Aaron opted for Rock Slide, while Ryosuke valued Stone Edge for the Thunderous Knockout. For what it's worth, Aaron didn't miss Stone Edge at all until facing down Ryosuke's own bulky Thunderous in the semis, where it did make a difference, but that set came down to some other things. Landorus Therian slotted in at third in overall world usage, tied with Landorus Incarnate. Therian might have been the hot new thing on the block, but Landorus Incarnate had its own shiny toys to play with, namely Sheer Force, which gave it an even bigger power boost than Sand Force and allowed it to use Life Orb for absolutely no drawback. While the rest of the world was fawning over Therian Intimidates, Gavin Michaels put the world on notice to what he considered was the superior Landorus form at US Nats, where he defied the doubters and piloted Landorus Incarnate to a first place finish, using a special Sheer Force Landorus that leveraged its great coverage via a moveset of Earth Power, Psychic, and Hidden Power Ice. Earth Power was self-explanatory and gave an edge over physical sets in that it could be used with impunity, no matter the teammate, meaning Gavin was free to run a team with no ground immunities. Psychic provided for great neutral coverage and one-hit KOs on two of the meta's biggest threats in Amoongus and Conkeldur. And finally, Hidden Power Ice was the perfect tool to dispatch any Therian pretenders while rubbing the 10 speed advantage in their face. While Incarnate didn't quite achieve the same results as Therian throughout the year, it was able to reach equal usage at Worlds with its bestial counterpart, and even notched one top 8 appearance of its own, courtesy of Matthias Helmut, who used it to become the first German master to ever top cut Worlds. And what that means is that if you count the forms together, Landorus was the most used Pokemon in top 8, which you probably shouldn't, but you could. While Landorus finished out Worlds without a trophy to its name, a post-Worlds tournament soon rectified that. Credit to familiar face Sajin Park, who won the Invitational Korean Legend Cup with his own Landorus Therian. It was a nice consolation prize for a year in which Landorus had been great, but not overwhelming. And for that, you should be thankful, because it won't last long.
Right from day one of Generation 6, Landorus Incarnate and its sheer force antics established it as among the tier's most dangerous. Once again, Rock Polish and Stealth Rock were both outstanding, but Lando I also had several excellent new tools to play with. The Lighty Twins wanted to switch into it even less since it now brandished a buff knockoff that would utterly decimate them. Of course, it didn't need to do this if it had its favorite bit of support waiting in the back, that of course being Pursuit. Lando I also started running Psychic quite often, allowing it to blast through Mega Venusaur with greater reliability. Ability. As the generation progressed, Rock Slide began seeing use as it smashed through the specially defensive Talon Flame, Assault Vest Tornado Styrian, and even the Mega Charizard Y that could check it otherwise. Furthermore, as Clefable became more and more effective and popular, Lando Eye adapted by incorporating Sludge Wave, which brutalized Clefable with ease. Countering Lando Eye by itself was already near impossible enough, and it made running stall and balance a risky, arguably foolish gambit, to say nothing of how impossible it was to handle when paired with Tyranitar, which ensured even even desperate stall teams running Cresselia would get destroyed. It took some time as there were more pressing threats to deal with for much of Gen 6 beforehand, which is an amazing thought, considering how utterly insane Lando I is. But sometime into Oraz, Landorus Incarnate received the ban hammer once again. Lando I wasn't quite as good in Ubers this time around. It wasn't bad, but since weather was no longer permanent, it couldn't reprise its previously superb niche of Scarf Sand Force. The complete lack of defensive utility was also undesirable in a metagame with such volatility especially when its role of being a powerful special attacker was less impressive by comparison to the pokes around it. However, on occasion, Lando I could shine. It was incredibly difficult to wall with knockoff for the laddies, sludge wave for Arceus Grass, and rock slide for Ho-Oh. Plus, its earth power was so strong, it could pull off the incredible achievement of one-hit KOing Primal Groudon. Getting it on the field was somewhat of a challenge. It pretty much only switched into Clef Key safely. So its niche was limited, but it was a niche. Once again, Lander Hysterion helped define OU with its defensive presence, a bulky Pokemon that supported its team without being passive. Its Stealth Rock and Scarf sets were metagame staples. The bulky Rocker was a great answer to threats like Talonflame and Mega Mawile, while the Scarf set prevented threats like Dragon Dad's Mega Tyranitar from getting out of hand. Landle T was particularly amazing because by checking something and forcing it out, it would then get a free U-turn, which it could use to safely bring in its own threatening teammates. Afterward, teammates would once again fall back on it, rinse and repeat. It was pretty much perfect team support. Lando T was also one of the tier's most reliable stealth rockers because it repeatedly switched into Rapid Spin Extra Drill, even punishing its spins with Rocky Helmet. While the Laddie Twins would not want to risk its hard-hitting U-turn to get a defog off, Intimidate and Rocky Helmet once again allowed it to help its team play around nearly everything, even if Lando T itself couldn't fully counter it, providing a crucial blend of defense and offense while pivoting in the face of devastating threats like Mega Metagross and Mega Charizard X. Lando T's Intimidate was such an amazing tool, it even found itself switching switching into the physically offensive water type of Zumaro and Mega Gyarados. When people said Lando T countered everything, they weren't really exaggerating too much. Of course, Lander Hysterion was a massive threat in its own right beyond just potential late game Scarf Earthquake cleanups, and after the Landorus Incarnate ban, this was recognized as players began making the most of it. This could be seen in many forms. For example, when Mega Sableye was annoying OU by blocking hazards everywhere, Lando T simply slapped Swords Dance onto its bulky rock set, and Mega Sableye wouldn't want to come near it nor would its friends Defog, Skarmory, and Zapdos for that matter, lest they get hit by Smackdown. However, the set that really began to take off was the Double Dancer, whose ability to take over the late game provided a crucial advantage in offense-on-offense -offense matchups. Many offensive teams' best physical check was their own Scarf Lander Hysterion, which ironically would prove to be their downfall, as it was nothing more than setup fodder for the Double Dancer. Other popular physical checks on offense didn't do so well either. Rotom Wash and Tank Garchomp were felled by boosted Stone Edges and Earthquake, with all the opportunities it got to switch in, it wasn't uncommon for Lando T to wall break for itself, then come back and grab the game-winning rock polish. Once the opposing team was weakened, it wouldn't need to boost its attack. After all, even something as naturally bulky as Keldeo took a stunning 79-93% to from an Earthplate boosted Earthquake. Other sets were experimented with. Lando T took its old Smackdown sets a step further by using Gravity, which completely ruined Skarmory and Rotom Wash's ability to withstand its Earthquake, not even letting them attempt to win a prediction war as they could against SmackDown, while also ensuring other Pokemon like Tornado Styrian, the Laddie Twins, Gliscor, and of course, opposing Lando T couldn't pivot in either. Of course, Gravity applied to Lando T's own team as well, so it had to ensure its team wouldn't crumple to opposing Earthquakes while Gravity was in effect. But this was easily solved by pairing it with Tangro. Furthermore, Gravity boosted moves' its accuracy, so Lando T even provided team support by using it. For example, its teammate Tornado Styrian would be able to span Hurricane without fear of its low accuracy 
accuracy. A substitute toxic set was briefly used as well, reliably ruining otherwise solid switches like Tangrowth and Slowbro. Most of the time, Lander Asterion was going to use a bulky set or its Scarf variant, but it could really do pretty much whatever it wanted to great effect, as it was one of OU's most defining forces. Lander Asterion was excellent in Ubers once again, this time utilizing its Scarf set. Like a Swiss army knife, it pivoted in and out of battle, switching into and threatening tier staples like Klefki and Primal Groudon with its powerful Earthquake. Taking advantage of the switch-ins it forced with U-Turn was also doubled as an excellent move with which it could threaten the Laddie Twins, Darkrai, and Mega Mew to Y, using Intimidate to help thwart threats like Rayquaza, Extreme Killer Arceus, and Mega Salamence, and generally providing a beautiful blend of defense and offense. It helped this team survive against opposing onslaughts, and while doing so, helped weaken the opposing team into cleanup range. It was a fixture on popular successful balanced spikes offenses for this incredible utility on both sides of the spectrum. It even did amazing things like hitting Arceus Rock incredibly hard even after a calm mind boost and outspeeding it while doing so. A combination of traits just about impossible to come by otherwise. So overall, Landorus was pretty much a perfect Pokemon across both forms once again in Generation 6. Now here is an excerpt from an article written at the beginning of the 2015 VGC season, giving a summary of the new meta in its early stages and about Lander Asterion's first foray into the Mega Evolution meta. Quote, A dominating force in VGC 2013, Landorus is still a very good Pokemon 2015. It doesn't feel like it has quite the impact it once had thanks to an increase in Pokemon that can knock it out with neutral attacks, competitive Milotic, and an increase in the use of Wide Guard, but it should still stay one of the format's most common Pokemon. End quote. A considered, well-reasoned, totally inoffensive take that still ended up far from the truth. Because here's the thing. 2015 might be Landorus's best meta ever. If you've ever looked at the world's top 8 for this year, you know what I'm talking about. But it doesn't do justice to the deep, all-reaching influence Landorus had on the metagame. While it's true that there was an overall increase in the meta's power level, Landorus found itself perfectly positioned as both support and check to the most important mons in 2015, the Megas. Landorus is one of the the absolute best answers to Mega Kangaskhan in the game, as it can intimidate Kangaskhan, threaten it with superpower, and resist power-up punches. Meanwhile, it shouldn't take much investigation to see why a fast physical attacker who loves to click Rock Slide would be a good answer to Charizard Y. Funnily enough, that also made Landorus one of Charizard's best partners. First, because it could click Earthquake freely, and second, because it was the best answer to itself. While Mega Metagross and Mega Mawile could both be intimidate immune before Mega evolving, a well-pivoted Landorus was still certainly capable of whittling down their offenses, and it boasted a powerful stab earthquake to threaten them out as well. Sure, there were other Megas that had better matchups, Gardevoir and Salamence being the most notable, as they were capable of simply blowing up Landorus, but Landorus had a good matchup on the vast majority of the Mega meta, as well as the regular meta, where it thrived against Pokemon like Terrakion, Thunderous, and Steel types like Heatran and Aegislash, who became more popular with the introduction of Fairy types. Finally, Landorus got a huge buff to one of its attacking options in Knockoff, which was now a premier attacking option and a great answer into pesky Cresselia. Landorus hit the ground running, or rather, it didn't hit the ground, but it still proceeded to move forward in a rapid and efficient fashion. While Lando had struggled to win gold hardware in 2013, it won three regionals in just the first month of competition, thanks to Aaron Trailer, Wolf Glick, and Alberto Lara. While Wolf and Alberto both used the more popular Scarf Landorus with U-Turn, Aaron opted for Assault Vest and packed both Superpower and Knockoff, foregoing U-Turn entirely. To be honest, this is a testament to how capable Lander Asterion was. Aaron himself said that it actually had negative synergy with his team due to his use of Unaware Clefable, but it still ended up being the best pick he could have chosen. And Landorus wasn't just winning, it was ubiquitous. First, second, third, and fifth place in St. Louis, first, fourth, seventh, and eighth in SoCal, third, sixth, eighth in Virginia, you get the point. It wasn't uncommon to see all three top teams of a tournament have Landorus, like in Italy, where Giovanni Milani's regional win saw his podium play place flanked by two other Landos, or in Melbourne, where Chris Giagazoglo saw the same story play out. It's paired with Kangaskhan, Gardevoir, Salamence, Metagross, Mawile, Charizard, and in Wolf's case, Bannit. It's at this point that it doesn't make any more sense for me to keep naming players who succeeded with it, because to be honest, you weren't special if you did. Around the world, Landorus was winning half the regionals and on half the top cut teams, thriving in basically any team you wanted. For Sand teams, it was immune to Sand. For Sun teams, it was the best sand counter around, able to resist weather with U-turn, fly over earthquakes, and intimidate their big hitters. It was definitely the strongest non-mega Pokemon in the entire format, and any thoughts that it might not be as good as in 2013 were quickly silenced. If anything, 
Landerus' dominance only grew with time. At the German Nationals, Landerus was on a staggering 7 out of the top 8 teams. Maybe even more astonishing, it was on 22 of the top 32 teams in the tournament, making it by far the most used Pokemon around. Landerus Therian won 5 different Nationals that year. Italy, Germany, UK, Japan, and the US. Thanks to Francisco Pardini, Marcus Statter, Marcus Steffen, Shoma Honami, and Toler Webb, with a variety of different team compositions. While Landers Therian might have stayed consistent, its sets did not. Throughout the year, the metagame shifted to be slightly bulkier, and smart Landers players innovated spreads that let it survive key hits while still dishing out damage and pivoting effectively. Trainers started to invest in defense to survive plus one life orb Bisharp Sucker Punch, whose defiant made it a frequent answer. Mamoswine Ice Shard was also something to consider. Special defense EVs also let Landers deal with those pesky opposing other halves of the genies of healthy meta. While Earthquake, a rock move, and superpower were on every set, the last move swung drastically with time. Early sets favored U-turn for momentum, but soon opposing Scarfers were rendering Lando's own Scarf worthless by surprise KOing it before it could switch. As time went on, many players adjusted to knockoff, relying on hard switching to Cycle Intimidate and utilizing knockoff's utility to scout other players' items, crucial in a closed sheet best of three format. Knockoff was also a huge boon for partners such as Kangaskhan, who appreciated the removal of items like Citrus Berry and Rocky Helmet. Some players, such as the US Nationals runner-up Rafael Bagara, even experimented with Choice Band, which allowed him to make his Landorus even more bulky than usual by moving around attack EVs. Angel Miranda, ever the Landorus innovator, brought his signature mixed Landorus to Nationals and placed 7th, running Life Orb with Earth Power, Hidden Power Ice, Stone Edge, and Protect. Even in a field of Landos, players found a way to stand out, and going into Worlds, the metagame still seemed quite open. And then, Chalk. Cresselia, Heatran, Amoongus, Landorus, Kangaskhan. The premier Japanese team composition, and the one that swept the entirety of Worlds Top 8. Just below that, an ocean of diverse teams, but in Top 8, it was Chalk all the way down. But if you take a look closely, you'll notice something. Most of the Chalk members were somewhat flexible. Cresselia could be Sylveon, Heatran could be another fire type like Volcarona or Entei, Amoongus could be Aegislash, and some players even opted to hit on the special side of the spectrum and use Mega Gardevoir instead of Mega Kang. In fact, only three of the top eight teams, champions Shoma Honamis, as well as those of the fifth placer Daiki Moriyama and seventh place Hayato Takahashi, were true chalk. The comps may have looked similar, but there were subtle differences. The beautiful minutia that make Pokemon Pokemon. But one Pokemon was still on every team, and that was Landorus Therian. To date, Landorus Therian's usage in 2015 is the only time one Pokemon has been on every team at World's Top 8. It must an unheard of 57% usage, 15% over the next most used Pokemon in Heatran. Remember how I said earlier that Landers was the undisputed best non-Mega in 2015? Scratch that, it was the undisputed best, no qualifier necessary. What's really interesting though, is the type of Landers that made up that top 8. Most of the Landers that we've talked about before this point were Scarf, but Japan did things differently. Shoma Honami coming from a victory at Japanese Nats to win Worlds, used Assault Vest Landorus. Since the meta had become more bulky, the extra speed wasn't needed, and Assault Vest let it match up even better into special attackers like Charizard, Sylveon, and Gardevoir. In order after Shoma, the Landorus items were Focus Sash, Life Orb, Yachberry, Assault Vest, Assault Vest two more times, another Life Orb, and finally, Leos Woltersdorf's Choice Band. Nary a scarf in sight. Assault Vest Lando quickly became all the rage for the rest of the format, with Intimidate on one side and Assault Vest on the other. Landorus was able to stick around for ages, allowing its partners to do the heavy offensive lifting. Of course, one mon that was entirely dedicated to offense was Landorus Incarnate. Sheer Force was unattainable at this point, but that didn't stop Incarnate from mustering some very respectable results in 2015. It shouldn't surprise you at this point to hear that Angel Miranda was the first player to give it some notoriety. The mixed Landorus steering he had used at Nats was directly adapted from his bronze medal Georgia Regionals team, which used Expert Belt Incarnate alongside Titar. Aaron Zeng would go on to use the exact same Incarnate Landers for a fourth place at Nationals. While this version didn't have the utility or defensive matchups that Therian did, it actually meant that it matched up better into, well, Landorus Therian, as well as any other anti-physical measures that teams had locked up. Landorus Incarnate could threaten KOs onto Therian with HP Ice while not fearing much reprisal, and the fact that it was primarily a special attacker meant it could ignore Intimidate when going for kills on Heatran and Aegislash. Even at minus one, and with a timid nature, Stone Edge was enough to KO any Charizard.
start. Incarnate was in the same ways a more reliable attacker than Therian, but without the same ability to function in every matchup. It didn't love Kangaskhan, for example, a nice niche pick that could function at a very high level when piloted correctly. But no one could deny that 2015 was Landorus Therian's year. Whether its competition was Mega Kangaskhan, Landorus Incarnate, Guard Shop, or anything else. That looks like Shoma most likely to pull this off, and we see him run. There it is, guys. Both players shaking hands, and Shoma Polnami is your 2015 Pokemon video game world champion. As he celebrates it again, passes out, no shoes, knocked his shoes right off. <laughs> <laughs> He's done, folks. He is done. However, 2016 brought steeper competition in the form of a restricted meta. GS Cup's landscape meant there was a high presence of several Pokemon who either threatened to blow past its Intimidate, Wallet outright, or both. But Landorus is nothing if not crafty, and when faced with a new situation, it will find a way to adapt, overcome, and succeed. It had one very, very good thing for it, an incredible matchup into Primal Groudon, who it could hamper with Intimidate and do heavy damage to it with Earthquake. Once it did that, there was no guaranteeing it started around. So while bulky landers had just been on the upswing, 2016 was big damage all the time. Choice Band or Life Orb used as a one-time check that could swing the momentum, do huge damage, and consider the job done. One player took that one and done mentality to the very limit, Wolf Glick, who gave Landorus one of its only wins of 2016 at Florida Regionals with a Bandit Explosion set. The rest was standard, Rock Slide, U-Turn, and of course Earthquake, but Wolf would use Explosion next to his Telepathy Dialga, guaranteeing massive damage on the other team with no casualties on his own side. The big benefit here was that even if the other side protected, it just allowed Wolf to click Trick Room, opening up the door for big sweeps from the rest of his team. Landorus saw a few other regional top cuts throughout the year, but nothing with as big a bang as Wolf's win. Kyogre was his most frequent partner by far, and a few other players used Dialga Landorus, but none were able to win a gold, and Landorus found itself appearing in fewer and fewer top 8s as time went on. At Worlds, it only managed one notable result in the entire competition. Matthias Sutodolski's 16th place on a Ray Ogre team. Landorus actually did better afterwards when Matthias used the same team to win Dortmund Regionals and Sajin Park snatched first at the Korean Autumn League. But it ended 2016 a far cry away from its 2015 greatness. Still, it's pretty admirable that even in a meta so unkind to it, Landorus was able to find the path to victory. The OU player base finally learned its lesson in Generation 7, and while they did release Landorus Incarnate, now universally viewed as an obvious uber, back into OU, they kept their eye on it and quickly determined it had no place in the tier. It was banned almost instantly, only following Zygarde Complete and Aegislash. In its brief time in the tier, it delighted in earth-powering Magirna and Toxapex's lights out, while smashing every ground resist with ease. Tapabulu got sludge-waved into oblivion, Mantine got rocked slided, so on and so forth. Sadly, Lando I was thoroughly mediocre in Ubers this time around. It could be threatening, but it wasn't special in that regard, and thus it just wasn't worth using something with such a crippling inability to switch in. It could threaten some teams, so it did technically have a niche, just not one that was going to bring it high level usage. Still a worthwhile trade off for it to finally achieve that well deserved quick ban. After Landorus and Karna's metaphorical 15 minutes of terrorizing OU were over, players turned to Landorus Therian, which really took Took off in usage. Now, that may seem obvious, but even by Lando T standards, it was getting used a lot in Gen 7. At its peak, it was on over 70% of teams. That is absolutely absurd. So why was Lando T so common, and presumably so good as to make it so common? Well, right off the bat, everyone was enamored with the possibilities of the Z move Sun and Moon had introduced, and Lander Hysterion immediately established itself as one of the best Z move users around, with both Rockium and Flyneum Z. Whether it was unboosted or raising its attack to nosebleed heights with Swords Dance, the raw power of Landorus T's Stone Edge turn Continental Crush, or Fly turn Supersonic Sky Strike, utterly devastated pretty much anything that wanted to switch into its powerful Earthquakes. Earthquake, Swords Dance, and Fly or Stone Edge only took up three move slots too, so what else did Lando T do? Capitalize on its natural defensive presence, as well as the switches it forced when threatening these insanely powerful attacks, and throw on Stealth Rock, of course, becoming one of the tier's best and most reliable 
reliable users of the move. Since Supersonic Sky Strike sets had the built-in power of stab on their Z-move, they often exude the extra boost of Swords Dance in order to include U-Turn, giving Lando T even more flexibility. As if all that wasn't enough depth to a Z-move sets alone, Flying EMZ Lando T could also choose, depending on the needs of its team, to shift away from the all-out offensive approach in favor of a bulkier spread, allowing it to both tank hits from one of the scariest sweepers around, Halucha, and use the Z-move to actually KO it back. Of course, as amazing as Z Lander Asturian was, in true Lando T fashion, it also ran several other excellent sets. It could run an offensive Z Stealth Rock style set, but with Earth Plate in lieu of the Z Crystal. This didn't just free a teammate to run Z, though that was of course a great benefit, but the extra boost to Earthquake was incredibly important for luring and destroying, of all things, Toxapex. It may seem weird, but Toxapex's MO was to stay in and survive moves as strong as Adamant Lander Asturian Earthquake, and to go for a Scald. Either way, it would regenerate off the damage, and if it got the burn, Lando T was ruined. Thus, in a one-on-one -on -one situation, offensive Lando T actually ran away from Toxapex until it slapped on Earthplate and blasted the Sea Urchin into smithereens. Stealth Rock Lando T could go all-out defensive too, commonly running Iapapa Berry as its item. This was incredible for effectively giving Lando T a second life, making it even better at playing around monstrous threats like Kartana and Mega Mawile over the course of the game. Of course, Rock's Lando T could go even more offensive than its Z-Move counterparts. It could function as an effective suicide lead for hyper offense teams, and with its high speed and in prison, it could block Stealth Rock from bulkier Stealth Rockers like Gliscor. Alternatively, it could use Rock Tomb, with the speed drop effect allowing it to ruin defog attempts from Lander Asterion. Either way, Lando T was a champ at setting up its own rocks and getting the game off to a bang with Explosion, chunking the opposition and setting the tempo for its teammates to follow up and hit fast and hard. Finally, Choice Scarf came back, as always, and was always a contender for Lando T's most popular set. In Ultra Sun and Moon, Lando T gained Defog, as if it didn't have all the utility in the world already. Most sets were more concerned with setting rocks itself, but Defog fit perfectly onto the Scarf set. It wasn't meant to be a reliable method of keeping hazards off, just a move that could help out far more than any alternative. Plus, to nobody's surprise, even Scarf Lando T was a fairly reliable Defogger, since it switched in so much and forced so many switches. Plus, the incredibly common Stealth Rock Heat Ran didn't exactly want to switch into it, meaning that Lando T's team would commonly be playing without rocks for at least a few turns. Once again, Lander Asterion was one of the best, most common, and defining OU Pokemon around. It wasn't just good, but amazing at pretty much everything it did, and it did a lot of different things, which is why its usage was so high so consistently. And for the first time, Landorus Incarnate was the better of the two Lando forms and Ubers. Lando T didn't have any niche at all, finding itself largely outclassed by Arceus Ground, one of the best Pokemon in the tier. Most notably, it was a much better answer to the newly threatening Zygarde complete than Lander Asterion was. Clef Key and the Laddie Twins disappearing from the tier was bad news for it as well. Scarf Lando T was no longer at all impressive in the new tier. So yes, we finally found the flaw. After three generations, one of Landorus's two forms was unviable in Ubers. But even then, it wasn't the one that was actually Uber itself, so it's not like it was supposed to. Thus, it maintains its streak of being a perfect Pokemon. Remember how I was feeling bad for Landorus after 2016? Waxing poetic about its decline, making it seem like it might be on a downswing? Spoiler alert, we were only at page 29 of the notes, with 47 more to go. Landorus is not going to go out that easy. In Gen 6, it was the fact that Landorus adapted so well to Megas. While Megas are still here, and Landorus is actually able to use this generation's signature mechanic, burning a Z-move on Earthquake gives you one of the strongest single target moves in the game, capable of obliterating anything that doesn't resist it. If there is any criticism of Therian's attacking prowess, is that you need to play it alongside a ground immunity for max value. But Z Crystal solved that problem in a most elegant way, giving it the single target ground stab it always wanted. In fact, Landorus's tectonic rage was so powerful that it allowed for bulkier EV spreads, similar to the idea of the careful bandit sets from years back. As for the metagame, Landorus certainly doesn't mind a large Tapu Koko presence, nor the prevalence of Megazard Y, who is still an incredible partner and and hated seeing Landorus itself. Bulu was its biggest check due to grassy terrain, but the fact that Bulu was not very good was a pretty big boon. Tapu Fini could also present problems, as many bulky water types had in the past, but Landorus's upsides were too many to ignore. As you might expect at this point, there were multiple strong ways to run Landorus. Assault Vest still provided the dual defensive boost that had been relevant last time it was in a Mega's metagame with non-restricted, and Coco ratcheting up the speed tears meant there was more value to Scarf these days as well. In the 
the end, Assault Vest was the most popular variant, with Grandium right behind. What's more, 2018 was a meta full of 50% pinch berries, meaning access to knockoff was a huge boon no matter which set you were running. Lander Steering was basically Mr. Potato Head. Pick an assortment of moves and items, slap them on, and it's probably going to look good. Again, there were simply too many players who found success with Landorus to name. So instead, I'll give you numbers. In 2018, Landorus Steering won 17 out of the 35 special events, 12 out of the 38 regionals, and 3 out of the 4 international championships. That is an almost 50% first place rate across all pre-Worlds events and 7,300 champion points just from first places, aka enough champion points to establish a micronation of Landori and have 18 of them qualify to Worlds. A few trends during the season to talk about. Early on in the season, Blake Hopper and Colin Hare created a Bulu and Landorus team that used a mixed Assault Vest Landorus with Earth Power and Sludge Bomb to negate Grassy Terrain's downsides and handle the opposing fairy teams. Blake got fifth with this at Dallas Regionals, and a couple mixed Landos showed up after that, including the Scarf variant Wolf Glick used on his own Bulu and Charizard X team to win the Charlotte Regionals. Adrian Sigler's Portland Regionals first place team went back to Assault Vest, as did the mixed set Landorus Carson Confer used to win Sao Paulo Internationals. Carson also integrated another new tech that a few players had seen success with, Rock Tomb, which opened up speed control for slower Pokemon on this team to wreak havoc. Speaking of internationals, Jeremy Rodriguez had his own innovation in the team he crafted to win North American internationals, Swords Dance. Jeremy's Landorus could be very bulky, then boost up and drop a Swords Dance boost to Tectonic Rage or even Earthquake next to his Rotom H and Drift Blim. With Tailwind in play, he only used two attacking moves, focusing on setting up and unleashing big damage. As for the last internationals winner, Alessio Yuri Boschetto won Oceana Internats with a standard Scarf 4 attack set, meaning Landorus won each of the Internats with a different item, a testament to its versatility you can't deny. Makes you wonder why Simone Sanvito didn't use, I don't know, Banded Landers to win EUIC. Slacking. There's also one other big meta development we need to talk about. It's the most important moment in 2018 history, if not VGC history. In March, another Intimidator started to crowd out the results graphics, and I think you might know who. That's right, with the release of its hidden ability, Incineroar had officially made its grand entrance. You might think that the birth of arguably the greatest Intimidator to ever do it would hamper Landorus, but it was just the opposite. While Landorus didn't appreciate being intimidated, Tectonic Rage was so powerful that it could one-hit KO Incineroar even through an Intimidate. You wanted to live in a cat-free zone. But the bigger deal was actually the synergy that Landorus had with Incineroar. Not really as an attacking duo, but as an endlessly pivoting Intimidate duo. Incineroar was the utility, and Landorus was the damage. With U-Turn, Landorus and Incineroar could repeatedly wear down the opponent's attacking stats, taking only negligible damage on the switch and facilitating an attacking partner. This was especially true with the Assault Vest sets. Although Choice Scarf made using U-Turn easier, Incin Landorus quickly established itself as one of the strongest cores of the format, infuriating opponents with ease as they swapped over and over. Round and round the Intimidators go, where they stop, nobody knows. When all was said and done, Landorus went into Worlds as the most used Pokemon in the format. Although if Incineroar had come out a bit earlier, it likely would have lost its crown. And after the dust had settled, it was the cat who was king. Paul Ruiz became Latin America's first world champion with an Incineroar and no Landorus Therian, although runner-up Emilio Forbes used both. In total, there were still six Landorus in World's Top 8, and once again, they ran the gamut of what was possible. Emilio used a bulky Rock Tomb Ground DMZ set, splitting the difference between power and offense, but there were also two mixed Scarf sets, one mixed Assault Vest set, a Bandit Super Power set, and a Swords Dance Ground DMZ set. 2018 may have been the year that Landorus lost two titles, being the World Championship and that of Best Intimidator, but it got a consolation at the Nashville Open happening simultaneously with Worlds. 371 players gathered for the biggest weekend in competitive Pokemon, duked it out with a chip on their shoulders, and Gilbert Gorachi was able to give Mick Scarf Lando a win in a tournament of killers. When the chips are down, Landorus adapts. This may have been its most versatile year yet, as players found ways to use it in hyper offense on both sides of the attacking split and as a defensive pivot. And of course, Landorus Therian would follow up a year in which it displayed its many talents by being pigeonholed into a single role. We already know that Landorus doesn't fare as well in the GS Cup format, but it still found one task it could perform better than anyone else, to absolutely obliterate fire and steel types to make way for Xerneas Sweep. This was an Incineroar stack attacker and Groudon extinction machine. Early on in Sun Series, some players 
players attempted to achieve this with a mix of moves and items like Choice Band. Brazilian player Gabriel Agati even used a specially crafted Grass Knot Safety Goggles Landers to clear Groudons. This Landers was a neat tech for any teams that really needed to deal with Groudon. Landle T was the only Pokemon capable of switching into both Groudon and Incineroar and two-hit KOing them, regardless of Intimidate or Sun. Very neat. But when the Moon series unleashed Z Crystals, Landorus found its role narrowing to that of a one-time tactical strike. Grounding Z was the only game in town, to the point that many players would run both Earth Power and Earthquake, as well as Neutral Nature, to ensure that they could grab the KOs they needed even through Intimidate or Assault Vest. The other two moves were usually U-Turn and Protect, moves that would turn playing around Landorus into a game of chicken. Are they gonna Tectonic Rage here? No, they protect it. Here? Nope, U-Turn. The Lando was a constant threat, creating power by its very presence, and if the player piloting it guessed right, they'd likely take a huge lead. Of course, a Pokemon who only really threatens one type of damage is not the most versatile, and Lando's usage reflected that. While a few South American players were able to give it a special vent wins, and Ashton Cox took first at the Santa Clara Regionals with the double ground set, Lando was virtually unseen in the season of the North American Internet. And for the first time since its release, a Lander Steering did not show up at all in the top ranks of the world's placement. Landorus arrived in Generation 8 with the Crown Tundra, and Landorus Incarnate was released into OU once again. Though, just like in Generation 7, it didn't last long. Corviknight seemed like a good check, but Lando I slapped on Calm Mind or Gravity and smashed it to pieces. And in true Lando I fashion, pretty much everything else dropped as well. From Mel Meadow to Galarian Slowking, Lando I chalked up its second consecutive quick ban and its fourth total ban from OU in as many generations. Landorus Therian may be one of OU's most defining Pokemon of all time, but it's Landorus Incarnate that's the really broken one. Generation 8 was also Lando I's best gen of Uber since Gen 5. It was a specific but legitimate one, as it became a staple of sticky web hyper offense teams with a set of Stealth Rock, Earth Power, Rock Slide, and Explosion. First, its teammate Slurpuff or Shuckle would set up sticky web. Shuckle could run Stealth Rock too, of course, but it couldn't be relied on to set up both rocks and webs consistently. Thus, if it had to pick one, it could go with the webs necessary for its team to function without losing rocks. Afterwards, Lando I would come in on something it scared out like Ho-Oh or Necrozma Duskmane and would set up rocks on the Force Switch. No Defogger was capable of switching into it and removing hazards thanks to Explosion, or Rock Slide in Ho-Oh's case, so it was reliable in maintaining hazards for its team. With webs up, Lando I was actually quite threatening in its own right, since it expanded the reach of opposing Pokemon it threatened greatly, now able to outrun the likes of Eternatus, Calyrex Shadow, and Scarf Kyogre. However, more important was the maintaining of rocks and potential potentially luring in the opponent's Defog Yvelta to hit it hard with Explosion. By sacrificing itself, Lando I would block Defog and preserve momentum, allowing its team to most optimally maintain both hazards and ride them to victory. Smacking Yvelta for heavy damage was also a great help in clearing the way for Lando I's partner, Calyrex Shadow. Lando I was just about never seen in Gen 8 Ubers outside of Sticky Web, but it was a critical facet of the playstyle's success. For the first time ever, Lando Asterion was used in OU with a specially defensive set. Why? In the brief period where Landorus Incarnate was destroying the tier, the player base bemoaned the lack of Gliscor, as that would theoretically be able to counter it now that Hidden Power had been removed from the game. Well, players couldn't use Special Defense Gliscor, but they could imitate it with Special Defense Landorus T, and it actually did quite well. It wasn't a hard counter to Lando I, but it did check it about as well as anything could. Not only did it withstand Psychic and respond with the ever-reliable Toxic Protect combination, which slapped Lando I's health while replenishing Lando OTs, it could also weaken Lando I with a strong knockoff that removed Life Orb. Furthermore, if Lando I used Gravity, Lando T would make that work itself, since it could now smack it with its own powerful Earthquake. Even after Lando I was banned, players continued using Special Defense on Lando T, having noticed just how many situations it could be useful in. In fact, using it so much that it became its standard. It still took physical hits quite well, but the Special Defense investment allowed it to take an enormous range of other threatening Pokemon it would otherwise crumple to. Lando I wasn't the only broken Pokemon it could help out against. It was overwhelmingly favored to survive Special Attack Magirna Ice Beam. It was never KO'd by four Special Attack Ferramosa Ice Beam, and just about never even with Stealth Rock, and it almost always took two Spec Shadow Balls from Specsure with Leftovers, always surviving the second with Protect. If Lando T could take these absurdly strong hits from Pokemon that were eventually banned, everything else in OU was a piece of cake in comparison. It devoured Specs Tapu Koko's Dazzling Gleams, it withstood Hurricanes from Zapdos 
Zapdos and Tornadus theory, and could even help against Pokemon like Dragapult and Volcarona. Essentially, it allowed Lando T to maximize its utility against the offensive terrorist roaming OU. In addition to its unmatched threat checking capabilities, Lando T was also, of course, a beacon of support in how it either set up its own stealth rock up or defogged opposing hazards away, and how, as always, its U turn was able to provide safe, riskless switch ins to the frailer, offensive threats on its own team, like Weavile. For all this, Lander Asterion was the most reliably spammable Pokemon in the tier, and we haven't even mentioned its capacity to act as an offensive threat. Without the option of Hidden Power Ice, Lander Asterion effectively walled itself for the most part. Yes, Toxic was very much used, but the slow, gradual pace of Toxic didn't fit on more offensive teams. This was irritating for offensive teams that wanted to utilize the otherwise massively threatening Zara Aura and Tapu Koko. There was one other way for Lander Asterion to deal with itself though, and that's what players started using. Explosion. Sure, it required you to sacrifice your own Lando T, but it was worth it when you were removing the opponent's Lando T, as the opponent would then be unable to withstand your electric type. This could definitely be considered the apex of all Lander Asterion wars. Using your own Lando T to lure in the other Lando T, then sacrificing yours to make sure they don't have theirs. To say the metagame centered around Lander Asterion would be a grand understatement. Anyway, there were several different variants of Explosion Lander Asterion going around. Choice Band was used for some time. In addition to its brutally powerful explosion, its immediately powerful earthquakes also let it shatter unsuspecting Melmetal, Clefable, and Toxapex. Swords Dance explosion variants were more overall consistent, as they didn't need to predict nearly as much. There were other attempts to use Lando T to take advantage of opposing Lando T without sacrificing one's own, namely with boosting substitute sets, which dodged Toxic and set up with either Bulk Up or Swords Dance. The problem was that one of the things defensive Lander Steering was best at and commonly used for was its capacity for U-turning into threats, and among the best and most popular of those threats were Weavile and Dragapult, whose triple axle move and infiltrator ability, respectively, would bypass Lando T's sub. And thanks to the support of their best friend Lando T using its slow U-turn, it would never have to switch directly into offensive Lando T and risk damage. There was one twist on the sub booster Lando T, which could potentially overcome this combination, Adrenaline Orb. In general, the concept of the item was great, as what better way to take advantage of Lando T's Intimidate than by turning it into a free speed boost. You would boost on the switch as the opposing Lando T came in, and then sub. With a plus one speed boost, you would no longer be revenge killed by Dragapult and Weavile, while with sub, you'd be protected from Weavile's Ice Shard. This set required incredibly precise timing, and couldn't be slapped onto teams haphazardly, which is why it wasn't as common as another Adrenaline Orb abuser, the excellent Kartana. However, it demonstrated that there really is no limit to what Lander's steering can do, which is what led to its status as the best Pokemon in Generation 8 OU. Lander's steering was excellent in Ubers as well. With Arceus Ground no longer around to outclass it, it functioned pretty much identically to OU, using its utility sets to switch in, set rocks, or defog them away, and then U-turn to bring a big threat in safely. This was highly appreciated for hard hitters that wanted to be careful with their health, such as Specs Kyogre, Xerneas, or Galarian Darmanitan. It was especially valuable as a defogger since it reliably switched into the otherwise irritating Thunder Wave Necrozma Duskmane. Furthermore, with a lack of Z-moves and removal of Primals, Lander is Steering was more effective at helping check and play around the likes of Zygarde Complete, Marsh Shadow, and Groudon. And best of all, it was a near perfect counter to the monstrously threatening Dragon Dance Zygarde. Really, as far as viability and popularity goes, Lander's Steering and Ubers wasn't too far behind its OU counterpart. It was an essential piece of the tier, capping off yet another outstanding generation. When we last saw Lander Asterion in doubles, it was at the lowest point it had ever been. Absent at Worlds, relegated to using dual ground moves just to blow up one thing, where was the Lando of old? The versatile one who would take you by surprise, win games by its- Oh, forget it. I'm not gonna trick you. It's a new generation, and Lander Asterion is, once again, on top. Landris wasn't allowed until Sword and Shield Series 7, but in flying over the pond to Galar, it found one more trick in its bag of goodies. See, Gen 7 gave Landris the single target physical ground move it had always wanted, so Gen 8 gave it the flying type counterpart, plus a whole bunch of complimentary add-ons to its first class seat. Landorus was an absolutely stellar Dynamax candidate due to fly. What was once a painful reminder of a gap in Landorus's coverage was now a massive Max Airstream, arguably the best move in the game. What's more, Max Quake Earthquake had all the benefits of Tectonic Rage, plus a nifty special defense boost that paired serendipitously well with Intimidate, and Max Rockfall gave Landorus weather control, as if it ever needed that. 
Landers entered a meta infested with Torco, Venus Sun, Regilecki, Colossal, Rillaboom, and of course, Incineroar. All normally good matchups. Its main worries came from Pokemon who could hit it super effectively like Glastrier, Tapu Fini, and Yoshifu Rapid Strike, who didn't care about Lando's Intimidate, as well as big special attackers like Moltres Galar. The shifting series format of Sword and Shield meant that Landers had to adapt quick and adapt often, which, as you should know by now, wasn't much of a problem. Funnily enough, the first Landers 3 to see success didn't have Fly at all. Joseph Ugarta used a Scarf set that looked like it could have been from any year prior to win the Victory Road Challenge. However, players quickly realized the power of Max Airstream. At this point, there were three main Landers variants. Fly, Earthquake, and Rock Slide were mandatory on pretty much every set. In the early days, Assault Vest variants were common and would usually run U-Turn or sometimes Super Power. Meanwhile, three attack sets with either SD or Protect had their choice of Life Orb for more damage or Lumberry to deal with the rampant status of Amoongus, Incineroar, Venusaur, and more. Because Landers liked the Dynamax so much to turn Fly into a usable move, Life Orb was the most common choice by far due to its reduced recoil on moves when they get big. Landers Therian wasn't quite up to the levels of its 2018 or 2016 glory days, but soon every region's qualifier for the Players Cup 2 had a few Landori in their midst. Series 8 introduced a rule set that allowed for one restricted Pokemon. In turn, Lumberry became much more common to handle Venusaur Sleep Powder powered by Groudon, and players also turned to an ancient, long-revered pairing. That's right, the genies of healthy meta are back, and they're better than ever. Say thank you. Thunderous Incarnate and Landorus Therian were maybe better partners than they'd have ever been. In addition to great typing coverage, the pair loved to boost each other. Landorus could add bulk and speed, while Physical Thunderous with superpower could also add on attack. The duel also also forms some of the best Zacian partners and Zacian counterplay around. And if there's one important thing about Sword and Shield, it's playing around the sword. Zacian greatly appreciated the boost from both Pokemon, as well as their ability to handle Sun teams, and in return checked Landorus' biggest enemy, Calyrex Ice. Landorus Therian was one of the few Pokemon able to beat Zacian in the frequent 1v1 endgames the dogs searched out, making it invaluable against the format's undisputed best Pokemon. At this point, play was relegated to online competition but Landorus immediately started racking up wins in tournaments like the Victory World Circuit Qualifiers, most frequently with Swords Dance and three attacks. In Taiwan, Wu Chen won Taiwan Regionals with a set that opted for Protect over Swords Dance and utilized Landorus' defensive synergy with Registeel, something to keep in mind for later. When the Victory Road Circuit reached its final, spectators were liable to think they were seeing double. Italy's Kevin Salvato and Spain's Eric Rios had virtually identical Sun Zacian teams in the finals, but with completely different movesets on most of the Pokemon. Landorus, however, was one of the similarities. Both opted for Assault Vest to ease the Shadow Rider matchup, with the only difference coming down to Rock Tomb on Kevin's side versus Slide on Eric's. Landorus continued to perform well throughout Series 8 and into Series 9, which was a return to the no restricted relegations of Series 7. Several players in particular started to establish themselves as repeat Landorus users, such as Brazil's Gabriel Agati, Peru's Renzo Navarro, and a slew of players from Italy, including Francesco P. Perro, Kevin Salvato, Leonardo Bonanomi, and Marco Silva. Players Cup 3 saw three Landorus teams in the top 8. Players Cup 4 had 5 players qualify with Landorus and finally granted Landorus its biggest win so far of the generation when Renzo Navarro used a Swords Dance set supporting Moltres Galar to win the entire thing. In fact, all 4 of the top teams at the Players Cup 4 used Swords Dance Landorus in one way or another. Renzo, Leonardo, and Kevin all opted for Life Orb while Fevsky Oskin used White Herb, which was slowly growing in popularity. Landorus Therian enjoyed similar popularity in the Asian Player Cup where it showed up on 3 of the top four teams. In Series 11, Joe UX9 was able to give it another tournament win in the Victory World Series 11 Challenge. Joe bucked the Swords Dance trend by giving his Landorus Protect and Life Orb, taking inspiration from Japanese players who he'd run into on ladder. Joe appreciated the way these players used Protect to stall Dynamax turns and gain boost from other Max Mons in safely, and found it valuable to ensure the Landorus slot wasn't a free target. Japanese players opting for a more defensive option on Landorus and finding success with it were have I heard that before? In a way though, everything up until this point was a prelude. Once Series 12 rolled around, things got serious because this was the format Worlds would be played on and in-person competition was back. Unfortunately for Landorus, it was also its historically worst format, GS Cup. However, this year was different and that was thanks to Zacian. As we mentioned, Landorus enjoyed a good matchup both with and against Zacian and it thus found more success than it ever had before in a double restricted format. It wasn't just anti-sun now, it was anti 
anti-dog as well. Players continue to optimize. At Salt Lake City Regionals, Z Costagliola debuted a max speed bulky white herb source dance set that could tank Zacian attacks and anything Groudon threw at it, which a few players used at Regionals after this. A lot of these early teams experimented with different restricted duels, but by the time EU International Championships rolled around, people found the best fit for Landorus, alongside Zacian and Kyogre in the appropriately named Swordfish comp. Swordfish typically consisted of a supporting cast of Incineroar and a Grass type. Early on, it was Rillaboom. If you haven't noticed, all these Pokemon have incredible synergy with Landorus Styrian. Zacian and Kyogre appreciate the help in the Sun matchup and are also restricted Pokemon who don't want a Dynamax, opening up the door for Lando to do its thing. Incineroar is its notorious partner in crime and Rillaboom opens up other bulky water types, but the best is saved for last because the genies of healthy meta have a new look. Yep, the last piece of the swordfish comp was often Tornadus who used Prankster Tailwind to boost Kyogre water spouts, forming the fearsome Torn Ogre duo. If not Tornadus, the comp would round out with Grimmsnarl, whose screens Landris equally appreciated to try and get off a of Swords Dance. At the EUIC, Oliver Escalin was the only Landris player in top 16, but his second place finish laid the template for tons of Lando players after him, and Landris was able to pick up some special event and regional wins, as well as a first place at Japan Nationals. Kentaro Matsumoto's version of this team showcased two rising trends, a new version of Swordfish that indexed into double grass types with Amoongus and Kartana over Incineroar, as well as the continued usage of three attack protect Landorus in Japan. Of the seven players to place top 32 at Japanese Nationals who used Landorus, all of whom qualified to Worlds, only two of them used Swords Dance, with all the rest opting for Protect. Assault Vest was a thing of the past at this point, considering it wouldn't really save you from a Kyogre Spout. Landorus managed to take another second place international finish at the NAIC, where longtime Lando player Gabriel Agati took second with yet another adjustment to Swordfish, bringing Incent back in to replace Amoongus. Going into Worlds, Lando was still one of the premier Pokemon in the format, but no one knew just which restricted duel would rule the day. Sure, Lando was amazing against Sun, but was Sun even the thing to be afraid of? As it turned out, Worlds had a very diverse metagame, and while two Swordfish players made top 8, third placer James Bake forwent Landorus in favor of Ndidi Redirection. James actually didn't like how useless Landorus was outside of Dynamax. The one Landorus that did make top 8 was thanks to Megan Rattle, who used her own twist on Swordfish, dropping most of the usual cast for Leech Seed, Celesteela, and Defiant Thunderous, and instead opting to gain speed control through Scary Face Grimmsnarl. Megan finished 6th at the tournament, using, of course, Protect Life Orb Landorus. Landorus Thurian still had 4 other representatives in Top Cut, none of whom who'd opted for Swordfish, instead using Caloric Shadow Zacian, Caloric Shadow Kyogre, and in 11th placer David Kodish's case, the very unexpected combo of Yveltal Dialga with Banded Landorus. And while Gabriel Agati wasn't able to give his favorite composition a strong showing at Worlds itself, a 3rd placer finish at the London Open secured the strength of the team he had been using since NAIC. Peng Chong Jun also used the double grass version of Swordfish to play 6, and there were 9 more Landorus steering in top 64 of the tournament, a respectable number. Landorus went on to see some use in the post-Worlds meta of Series 13, which was a no-holds-barred-anything-goes meta, and Series 14, which was Series 12 again? Man, they gotta name these better. However, there's one more thing to say about Landorus. It's not just the Therian form. You thought I'd forgotten about an Incarnate, huh? Nah, Incarnate got all the same pros as Therian. Max Airstream access, the ability to boost its own special defense, and an additional tool in Sludge Bomb's special attack boosting. That said, it was still an overall worse mod for doubles. Players tried to use it early on, but this is actually a moment where Therian uses Life Orb better in some ways, since the sheer force Life Orb interaction means less if you're always Dynamax anyways. But there's one Incarnate team we absolutely have to talk about. The one that Hippolyte Bernard took to 9th place at Worlds. If you can imagine, Landers Incarnate wasn't even the star of the show here. It was Shedinja. Throughout the season, France had become known as a strong part of the Shedinja contingent, represented especially by Hippolyte and his friend Thomas Gravui. While both players used Shedinja for all of Series 12, Landers Incarnate was a world-specific adjustment. To understand the pick, you need to understand the team's theory. The idea was to run the overwhelming power of Swordfish for most matchups, then have Shedinja for other Zacian plus Kyogre teams, which often lacked any way to hit Shedinja. In order to win other matchups, Hippolyte and Thomas needed a Pokemon that could beat the answers to both Swordfish and Shedinja, Groudon, Lunala, and Gastrodon. The answer? Assault Vest, Landorus, Incarnate with a move set of Stone Edge, Earth Power, Grass Knot, and Fly. This power could function as a solo Dynamax user while handling Zacian, Groudon, 
Hippolyte, Incineroar, Rillaboom, Charizard, Thunderous, Shadow Rider, Calyrex, and Gastrodon. Hippolyte finished 9th at Worlds, as we mentioned, but this team really took off at the London Open the next day. Thomas managed to finish 4th, while 4 other players of the team placed in the top 64, showcasing what a solid comp the group had built. And that, until now, is it. With Landorus still not in the Paldia decks, we're left to wonder how it will adapt. Because let me tell you this, it will adapt. You know, in writing this, we've come to appreciate Landorus. He's tormented us for so long, an inescapable phantom in our notes. We can type his name without thinking. It's an automatic response for my body when I open up Google Docs. And I know you've thought it too. Screw this guy. He's always around. Who does he think he is? But imagine being him, the burden he must feel. So much expectation every year to excel, exceed, outstrip expectations. Each format brings new rigors and pains to contend with, and yet he strives endlessly, adapting and molding himself to every situation in the hopes that he patch up some hopeful trainer's team. We ridicule Landorus for what? greatness? But how many dreams has he made come true? For how many trophies has he borne the majority of the weight? With him, our world is sometimes stayed. Without him, it is uncertain and chaotic. He is the ultimate overachiever, the gifted kid who still feels compelled to perfection even when circumstances are against him. He is, in short, trying his best. And that's it. So how great was Landorus actually? Well, what we have here is one of the greatest Pokemon of all time with both forms in both singles and VGC in OU and Ubers. There's pretty much nowhere either form of Landorus won't excel. Landorus is an OU icon and VGC icon, of course, but the comparatively overlooked incarnate form is not so only because it's too good for OU with four bands is as many generations. One cannot heap enough praise on both Landorus forms. It seems a fundamental truth that they will always be among the best, most common, and defining Pokemon around. And if you made it to the end, dear viewer, we thank you so much, and we hope you enjoyed La La Landorus. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know, what do you think of the video? Do you think Landorus will do well in competitive Gen 9 in either format? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. And also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all we got. See you in the next flick.